Senator, okay. thanks for joining us. Absolutely. And you all know Eric, uh, he does uh, energy for us in uh, DC and is very good at it. Absolutely. Yes, uh, thanks for joining us, Senator. We've got uh, about 100 people on the town hall with us right now. Um, Great. Thought would, would uh, just really kick right off with a brief introduction of what we're doing at Lignite Energy Council. We're having a couple of these taking advantage of the downtime and technology to welcome members of our delegation on and do some energy updates from them, allow you some opportunities to talk to us about what's going on in DC. You know, most of our folks on the call know you, Senator, uh, but for those who don't, uh, Senator Hovind's been in D.C. for most of the uh, previous decade working on things that are important to North Dakota, including energy policy. Um, during his 10 years as governor, he really set a high watermark for states that are doing energy development um, and using a comprehensive energy policy. And he's uh, trying to implement that same comprehensive energy policy at the federal level that allows us to take advantage of all of our natural resources. Uh, building toward true energy security. Um, just a couple of things, Senator, before we kick this off, thank you for your recent letter to FERC. I'm sure you'll be filling us in on some of those details, as well as uh, signing the letter that's being passed around the Senate regarding the production tax credit. Those are just a couple of recent issues for those of you on the phone that Senator Hoban has been a leader in reaching out um, and representing the coal industry in really a tumultuous time in Washington, D.C. We know you have a lot on your plate, Senator. Thank you for taking the time. and. Let's uh, just kick it off if you had any introductory remarks or wanted to give us any updates before we kicked off some of the questions. Well, like you say, it, you know, it's a challenging time. And so we're just trying to find ways to help our uh, coal-fired electric industry through it. And you know, we, we think we have the most advanced, well, we do have the most advanced uh, coal-fired electric, uh, electricity uh, in the country. And so on these issues that uh, cost and, and uh, also the environmental issues like carbon capture we, we think that this is the place that uh, you know we can lead in terms of innovative uh, solutions uh, two of the things that we've worked on very hard uh, recently are 45q we'd actually passed 45q several years ago but we had a devil of a time getting it implemented i'm not i'm not sure why but we worked very hard on that i finally actually uh, talk to the president in front of our Republican caucus um, not that long ago uh, in the Senate and uh, just said, hey, you know, we've been working with Treasury, we've been working with the Department of Energy, uh, we've been working with EPA, and they're all great, but we still don't have 45Q in place in a way that works. Uh, and, you know, we passed the bill two years ago, and uh, it was really that meeting that broke it loose. Um, his chief of staff, Mark Meadows, got a hold of me that afternoon, and we followed up with Treasury as well as uh, with uh, the others at the White House that had been working on it. And I think within a week, we had 45Q out. And, and so now we have it, and it's, of course, $50 a ton for this, for uh, CO2 that's sequestered uh, without tertiary oil recovery, $35 a ton for uh, uh, tertiary recovery. So uh, it... it creates a real revenue stream right away, certainly for companies like DGC that are already capturing and separating. Um, they have a, a real opportunity now with all of the CO2 that they're not sending up to Canada uh, for tertiary oil recovery to uh, to sequester it. And as I say, it's, it's $50 a, a ton is, is, is the benefit. Of course, in the case of a cooperative, they need a counterparty to utilize that uh, tax credit, um, but we're now working to try to see if we can't also create an option whereby you wouldn't have to have the counterparty. So if for uh, uh, g and that's, that, that's not uh, an IOU, that, that's cooperative, uh, orga organizes a cooperative, um, it would be nice if we could actually get that as direct assistance and then you'd have the option of the tax credit or, or getting that direct assistance, which obviously in the case of Coal Creek would be a, a, a help. And so I'm working very hard on that. And uh, so is Eric, right, Eric? You can just nod your head if you are. That, that's good. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. He's working very hard on it. So if we can, we'd like to have that as an option uh, or anything else that we can do to enhance that 45Q. So that's one thing that we think is important. Um, 
in terms of trying to help our coal industry with a revenue source and competitive viability. But it's also part of us continuing to deliver the message, and all of you need to help us with that, delivering that message both publicly, but certainly to members of Congress and, and senators, that that's going to be important, not only here in this country, but you know beyond, because if you really want to capture CO2, we have the technological viability to do that. We lead in that here in North Dakota, but we need the economic viability to do it. And that certainly is, is a help uh, in making that happen. And uh, we've had very good discussions with Basin. We're excited about them moving forward with it. I'm hopeful that there's a way for Coal Creek to uh, utilize that as part of uh, something that would help them in the current situation as well. We continue to, to work that. We've also worked a lot with uh, the FERC uh, and trying to make sure the coal is fairly valued in terms of its resiliency and reliability for the grid. They, the FERC, as you've seen, has done some things that have been helpful in the eastern power markets. The challenge in MISO is that you have so much natural gas and wind that it makes it more uh, problematic for us, but we continue to try to press for, uh, for assistance in, in regard to those things. Also, we have been working for some time, uh, as you know, with the EERC, not only on cooperative agreements, which we've continued, but specifically on things like Project Tundra, where I think we've secured uh, between 40 and $50 million to date to help uh, conventional power plants unlike DGC, to actually now help conventional power plants make that transition to capturing that CO2. Certainly, Minkota has been a leader there, and we think that they are going to be, I mean, we think they're making very good progress on getting to a point where they can um, sequester the CO2 and uh, realize the tax credit, or the benefit from the tax credit uh, there as well through the assistance that they are getting not only from the federal DOT, which we work to secure as part of Project Tender, but also the Lignite Energy Council, uh, the Industrial Commission, and the Lignite Research Council, excuse me, um, at the state level, along with you and the, the, the private partners in that uh, Project Tender enterprise. So those are some of the things that we continue to work on, as well as uh, 48A in terms of making it somewhat easier to capture that CO2 in terms of the percentage you're required to capture, um, and then just any other regulatory issues to, to try to make sure that coal continues as a, an important part of our, our baseload generation. So I, I think I'd stop there and maybe check with Eric. Eric, is there something you want to throw in on the front end, Eric, before I turn it back to Jason, then we'll just try to have an interactive uh, discussion with your members in whatever way you want. I think you hit all the, the high points, Senator, very well. Okay, so then Jason, we'll just turn it back and, and you know, for questions, comments, input, however you want to, you know, go through this. Sounds, Sounds good. Thanks, Senator. Um, Jonathan's got a couple of questions that have come in over chat, but as he's looking for those questions, number one, just for the folks on the phone who don't live this day in and day out like Senator Hoven and his staff do, you know, you think you get a big legislative victory like 45Q, however many years ago it was. Um, but once the president signs that, that's basically become just the beginning of the struggle, right? It, it just transfers. Uh, you got it signed into law, but it, it's not real yet until you got the regulations and the payout and the schedule and those types of things. So, again, uh, Senator Hoven it, it has been a, a huge advocate in after it's law kind of sometimes the hard part begins and it's just been a, a nonstop struggle that he's been at the forefront of in making sure that we get not just the law passed, but the implementation process that we need to make it reality. So uh, Jonathan, did we get any questions coming in over the chat? Sure, thank you, Jason. And thanks Senator and Eric for, uh, for joining us today. So one of the questions that we've got is kind of general, but um, do you foresee that there'll be any more uh, economic stimulus packages that are going to be proposed or passed in the, in the near, ter near term? Well, yeah, uh, I would say by early August, we'll have uh, another assistance package passed uh, for coronavirus. I, I, I think by the first week in August, we'll have that passed. Um, I'm already working on the ag piece. As a matter of fact, earlier today, we had a 
virtual video con or a video conference with with all these producer groups from around the state because we're putting together um, the right now I chair Ag Pro, so I'm working to put together the Ag piece of that legislation and like you say Ag is going to be part of it and I think we'll have something passed by the first week in August in the energy portion of it that's where I'm trying to include something that would further help in terms of 45Q, either the ability to get it as direct assistance or maybe even extending how many years you could get it as a tax credit. Those are the two ideas that have been brought forward to me, and that's what I would try to include if I can. Uh, other things we're working on is we'd already gotten uh, the REC's approved for participation under the, the pay Paycheck Protection Plan, so we've already gotten that. Um, and But the other, um, is that I, I'm trying to include something that would allow them to refinance um, through uh, uh, the uh, rural uh, utility service, um, which I think would help them bring down their cost structure. So those are some of the things we're, so yes, and those are some of the things we're trying to work on. And if there's some others you want to bring up, please do. Yeah, Senator. Senator um, uh, hold on just one sec, Luke. Uh, Senator, you know, you're talking about that direct pay on the 45Q. The way I understand it, uh, moving to from the current model to a direct pay really shouldn't increase the score or increase the budget deficit or any of those things. Um, so where is uh, the opposition to that coming from? Is it just... Um, I guess I'm not seeing where some of the opposition might be centered around moving to that direct pay, which really could have a pretty significant impact on the industry. It, it doesn't increase. In essence, you're right. In a way, it doesn't increase the cost, but it does. It is scored differently. And okay. so that's the challenge, right? Okay. The difference between a tax credit and providing the assistance directly, that, that's going to be our, our challenge is the way the cost is scored. So that, that's the challenge. Okay, thanks. Luke? Sorry, uh, Senator, just a quick follow-up on the stimulus. I know there's um, concern among, you know, businesses and others about liability reform related to COVID um, and some protections about, you know, employees and those type of things. Is Do you think, I know that Senator McConnell had touched on that a little bit. Do you think that would be part of this package you're, you're referring to? I think it will be. I mean, Senator uh, McConnell has said that it, it has to be. I mean, he's laid that down as a requirement. And so, yes, I, I think it, it will be. Um, you know, that's going to be – our colleagues on the other side of the aisle are, are not as supportive of it. So that will be something that, you know, we will try to get the liability reform or protection. I think we'll get it. They're going to push very hard to get something in return. We'll see what that is. If it's some of the green initiatives – and I – I don't know. We'll see. Uh, obviously, we're concerned about that. Uh, but that's where I would say, okay, then we need some uh, enhancements to 45Q like we're talking about. It, it may create some opportunities there. Sounds good. Thank you. Jonathan, do we have another question come in? Yes, we do. So, um, you know, earlier on, there was a lot of talk um, after the first round of stimulus was passed that there would possibly be some infrastructure uh, spending that would go on. And then that kind of seemed to, to die down a little bit. Has that been brought up anymore? Or is it just too difficult in an election year to, to consider? It, it's certainly part of the discussion. Um, I, at this point, would say I'm not convinced it's going to be part of this package. Uh, I think the infrastructure bill is more likely to be a separate package, but that I, I'd have to put that in the we'll see category. Um, you know, the House has talked about a 1.5. Well, I mean, the House right now has passed a three trillion dollar coronavirus package, and they passed the 1.5 trillion dollar infrastructure package. The challenge is, how do you pay for this, and what's the impact on the budget deficit? And these are very real issues. We're, we're going to move something, in my opinion, on coronavirus. Uh, I think it's going to be substantially less cost. I think it'll be in the range of a trillion, which is still an awful lot. But we're looking very hard at what can we do that's needed and the most effective, but also we've got to be cognizant of the impact on the debt and the deficit. 
So the challenge with the infrastructure bill is how you pay for it. Um, but in answer to your question, yes, it's being discussed. It's possible it could be in the next coronavirus bill. I think it's more likely to be a separate bill. Okay. Then, you know, then the only other question is the relative size of it. Do you do something like the House passed, 1.5 trillion, concern being the cost and the pay-fors and that kind of thing, or do you do something like what's come out of the Environment and Public Works Committee, which Senator Kramer serves on, John Barrasso from Wyoming heads that committee, uh, they put out a smaller package, do we pass that? I think that may be more likely. So yeah, we could get an infrastructure bill, but I think it would be separate, and I think it might look more like the Senate version, which is bipartisan. So Senator, we have a question here. Um, yesterday, or maybe the day before, Joe Biden put out a plan related to uh, carbon emissions, and that was to eliminate all emissions by 2035 from our nation's natural gas and coal power plants. I just wondered if you had a chance to to read that plan and your thoughts about um, about how that would actually progress if down the road. Yeah, I don't think that works. I mean, I think that's like the Green New Deal where you've got this huge cost, it's unrealistic, it would put so many people out of work, it would dramatically increase their energy costs, and it's as much a social program as it is an energy program. So I, I just don't think it's a viable approach. Uh, you know, we need to, to do the kind of things that I think we've done here in North Dakota. And, and obviously I'm a little biased because as Jason said at the outset, I've worked on these things since 2000. But I think, you know, we've put in place a diverse uh, energy uh, environment with incredible number of good paying jobs with the latest greatest innovation that not only produces the lowest cost energy in a country from many different sources, but is the most innovative and creative and frankly provides the best environmental stewardship. And, and to me, that's the approach that we've got to continue. And the kind of things that we're working on, if you look at it, it not only provides us with more energy in this country, uh, continued good quality jobs and more of them, better dependability, but better environmental stewardship. I mean, how that is absolutely the right approach and that's not the approach that that by the senator uh former vice president biden is, is uh pitching in his plan sounds good uh we had a question come in kind of related uh to this uh covid relief uh response packages uh as well as some of the energy things that we've happened uh, I know that you're on a, a letter that's being passed around to uh, about the extension of the PTC. Uh, what are the, I don't know, if you could give me an, an odds or your feeling on, I know the uh, the environmental groups are working hard for their priorities, uh, extension, perhaps expansion of the PTC and those things are always there, but uh, what's your sense regarding the finality of this deal that was reached a few cycles ago saying, we're gonna let the PTC as it exists phase out? Well, I worked on that with Senator John Thune and others, and OEA. And the agreement was that we would phase it out. That was the agreement. And OEA was on board with us. They agreed to it. And so, you know, then when uh, the House uh, put an additional extension back on the, the uh, funding bill for the entire year that included really important things like funding our military, vital farm assistance that I'd worked to get, that that was in direct contradiction to what we had worked out with the industry, okay? And I opposed it, but it got included as part of that package. And as you know, since then, Senator Kramer and I have sponsored le legislation to stop the PTC and, and so forth. Now, I've come to you and other groups and said, look, the House has now put forward something where again, they're gonna do more in the green energy world but they also, if you saw, included enhancements to 45Q. Now, I don't think those enhancements are sufficient, but one of the things I've come and asked you and others about is, okay, if we're working on, if there's gonna be this, this push to get some of these green programs, then how should we approach this? I mean, again, I think we should have, you know, the market forces like you do, but if they're gonna push for something more, whether it's on PTC or solar or something else, we should have some more on 45Q, yeah. particularly if that helps us with some of the situations like Coal Creek is facing 
and some of our other plants too right now. Yeah. And so that's the position I've taken is no, that should have been phased out. But if that if something like that's going to be in the bill, we sure as heck should have some more enhancements on 45Q that I think could help us. Now, if, yeah. if somebody has a different idea there, you all need to let me know because that's, Erica, you can jump in here again, but I think that's how we're approaching it right now based on our discussion with you and others in our lignite energy industry. I, 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 no one should be confused about how strongly I support uh, our uh, coal-fired electric industry in North Dakota. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and, you know, uh, from from our perspective, that 45Q, the 45A, some of the things you are working on, uh, our challenge is, uh, as you describe it, the magnitude of those things uh, sometimes is offset by the harm from a PTC, which is on us, on the industry, on the state to come up and say, here's here's a plan that works better for the industry and gets us on a equal competitive footing from a resilient standpoint or from an R&D standpoint from an enhancement to 45Q and just appreciate your awareness of that and your support of the industry on those issues. In a nutshell, and again, I mean, you talk among your members and, and I, any feedback you have, I want to have it. But in a nutshell, the way we're working on this is we're saying, no, there should not be uh, additional PTC and so forth. The agreement was that was to be phased out. If there is anything like that, then at a minimum, we, we need to have some enhancements to 45Q. Yeah. Um, and, and I, or something else that might be equally beneficial. I'm not sure what that would be. Right now, to me, I think the 45Q right. is, is the most beneficial. But now, if yeah. we're missing anything there, you, you, you need to come back and talk yeah. to us because that's how we're approaching it. We didn't you know, just come to this all on our own. We came and asked you guys, okay, what do we need to be working on and, and how should we be approaching? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, Senator, uh, the right. next... Oh, go ahead, Luke. I was saying the next question uh, from the chat is, um, what is the focus related to FERC and trying to create a more level playing field when power prices are so low to begin with because of such a surplus of energy? at this time making it uh, not necessarily a marketable commodity so i think the question really is is there anything um, happening on that level we've worked a lot with FERC. um we know the chairman neil chatterjee very well uh worked with him for a long time uh, and, and what we're trying to get is fair evaluation for coal particularly in terms of res resiliency and reliability for the grid you've seen in the pgm and some of the eastern power pools where some of the FERC rules have really helped in terms of how they bid uh, into the, uh, the the purchase power agreement. The, the thing that we face in MISO is you've got so much gas and so much wind uh, that it makes it a tougher proposition for us here in MISO. Um, that being said, we're still pushing FERC to, to make sure that, that we do have fair valuation and that we have uh, consideration provided to base load for resiliency and reliability. To that end, we had um, uh, Mac McLennan uh, was in DC on, I don't, wanna, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. he maybe did it remotely. Nowadays, everything, you know, is video conference because of COVID. But he testified, we had worked to, to get him set up to testify in, uh, uh, in, to FERC on how uh, they should take steps to help uh, fairly value base load. So Eric, any follow up on that one from uh, Mac's uh, presentation? That's correct. Uh, Mac did a, a great job in, in making the case from uh, the technical the technical side and FERC has an open docket um, from their technical conference on COVID impacts on the energy industry at large. And so um, other members of the Lignite Council want to submit comments and technical information for the FERC. They are they are receptive uh, and open to receiving that information. Great, thank you, John. Did we get any other questions from? I think we had one or two more come in when I was looking. Yes. So so I just got one from our friends at MDU. 
um, and I'll read it for you. Uh, first, they wanted to thank you for signing on to a letter to encourage an additional 4.3 billion in funding for LIHEAP, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. Um, they think that the increased LIHEAP funding will be key to helping low income energy customers pay their bills through these challenging times. And they appreciate your help and support on that. Um, both Eric and Sean from your team have been very helpful on that front. Can you give us some sense of where that funding request is at in the mix of the of a future relief package? I think we'll get more money for LIHEAP. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Um, yeah. You know, um, it this one of the things that you learn from this pandemic, right, is the critical nature of the electric industry. Um, and on the one hand, that's great because it reinforces how important we are. But on the other, um, some of our guys get crunched on the finances because you just can't simply shut people's power off through these things. And and the utilities made some very quick decisions on on how to approach those folks who weren't paying their bills. Um, anyway, Senator, just appreciate you being aware of that and, and thanks for the work uh, on backfilling some of that funding. It's a it's a difficult time for everybody and um, including our utilities, so thank you. It, um, it is, so, and I think they have really tried to, to help people through this tough stretch and it's important that they do and that they continue to. And at the same time, that's why somebody brought up the liability protection. Um, and that is so important because as companies continue to help and start up and all that, we have to be careful that they're, when they're already having a hard time, uh, you know, with uh, everything else, that they're not also facing the cost of lawsuits. Yeah. So, Senator, we had an, an email question come in. Um, you touched on conversations taking place uh, among Basin Electric regarding Coal Creek. Can you expand on the options that are on the table or what that relationship may look like? Well, I mean, I have to be careful. I think it's up to uh, the companies involved to talk about their approach. I don't speak for them. Um, but what I'm trying to do is help create some economics that help Coal Creek um, continue to operate. And obviously, you all know very well, because you're the Lignite Energy Council, you're all about how these companies cooperate and work together because it's they're interconnected. The grid's interconnected, and you know this all ties together, which is one of the reasons your organization is such a, an important one, because you're a big part of that integration and coordination. So needless to say, we've had conversations with Basin, with North American Coal, uh, as well as with uh, Great River Energy and others, and we will continue to do that, and and the uh, LE, uh, LEC and uh, the state, the governor's office, um, on anything we can do to help create um, good economics, better economics, innovation or uh, coordination, anything and everything it takes to try to, to keep that base load in place because I firmly believe as you do that that base load is important and we just we face an environment right now that in the near term makes it very challenging I mean it, not only the issues with wind and PTC like we've talked about but beyond that the fact that right now you know we're in a situation where natural gas is so very inexpensive that it puts additional pressure on and over the longer term, you know, we've got to take a longer term view of this. So we're trying to come up with things that help. Uh, but I think whatever solution we get to, and hopefully we get to one, is it's, it's not going to be just Coal Creek. It, it's going to involve the other players in our industry as well. So suffice it. I, I think what I would say is I think we've got people working together. I, I, I have, I, you know, I think about North Dakota as I think you know, our people work together extremely well. Their common sense, and particularly in light of all things going on in this country today, I think <laughs> North Dakota is a real model yeah. of people that work together and with a community spirit, give and take. And that's certainly true in your industry. So we have to keep these different players working together to get to a solution that that, that is good for the whole state. And they are. 
but we have to understand that the many solution I think is going to require that, 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 that we have some kind of working together. And, and I think you obviously are probably the lead organization in that effort. Thanks, Senator, uh, for your awareness on that issue. Um, you know, shifting gears a little bit, but uh, with all the natural gas going in the MISO market, maybe it's all related anyway uh, with the growth in the Bakken. Uh, what's your thoughts, given the Bakken's essential place in North Dakota's economy, uh, thoughts on the federal court decisions, dueling decisions on do you shut it down and drain it? Should it keep operating? Uh, you've watched that process un un uh, unspool from day one. What what are your thoughts on that? You talking about DAPL? Yeah. Well, heaven's sakes. I mean, it's got all the latest, greatest safety features. It's been operating for three years without incidents. It's had many reviews at the state and the federal level. Uh, you know, fortunately, the appellate court decided they can continue to operate while this is adjudicated. And hopefully, the ultimately, the court would determine that those reviews have been done. But even if they don't go that far, which we hope they will, hopefully they'll continue to make sure the pipeline continues to operate while the Corps finishes out whatever EIS may be required by the court, and then the, the, the company continues to operate. So at least based on this latest decision, there's a pathway, actually multiple paths, I think several pathways, and Eric, I'm going to give you a chance to, you know, if I got any of this wrong, to jump in here, but essentially... As long as they allow the pipeline to operate while they finish out whatever process the court requires, I think this works. And they should because it's got all the safety features. They've operated for three years without an incident. And it would cause real harm to our energy industry, to jobs in North Dakota, to the state of North Dakota, to all the citizens because of the revenue impact to the citizens, not to mention, look at look at three affiliated tribes, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and, and Arikara tribes, you know, fellow Native American, fellow reservation that would be very much and very significantly negatively impacted if you shut that pipeline down because of all of the energy on, on the three affiliated tribe reservation. So, I mean, and, and there's more impacts than that. But at least now with this initial ruling, if, if the appellate court keeps that in place, then the court can decide, okay, have they done sufficient environmental reviews? And if they have, great, then on we go and, and we're done. If the court decides, no, the, the core needs to finish out this EIS, the core can do that, but either way, the pipeline continues to operate. So that's the key. And it's very important that it goes that way because of many negative impacts on our industry, on our state, um, you know, at a time when they're, at a tough time for them. So again, that was a very important ruling and, and hopefully, you know, they'll continue to be able to operate while this is finished up. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, next question is kind of a, a broader scale, but uh, one of the things that particularly impacted us at the beginning of this COVID crisis was some of the supply chain crunches that were felt in different things in our industry, we're particularly interested in developing new supply chains of things like rare earth elements, right? So what's, is there any movement toward, uh, or, or is it too early to say we've learned lessons about supply chain importance and to focus on more domestic sources, not just of rare earth elements, but of a lot of other critical materials? I think so, and I'd have two comments on that. One is that the DOE has a program, $122 million program, to see uh, if they can't develop and, and actually commercialize some of these rare earth minerals from uh, the lignite energy industry. And so we are already working to try to secure funding from the DOE. What, what do they call that program, Eric? Uh, I believe it's uh, Advanced Coal Innovation Centers. Yeah. And so we're and trying to- they're gonna be to, regional, regionally based. Yeah, so we'd like to tap into that. And, you know, and again, back to, to Coal Creek, you know, as many of those kind of things as we can get going uh, here are important. You, fly ash is one of the things that was really developed at Coal Creek, you know, that use of fly ash as a byproduct rather than a landfill item for asphalt, highways, all kind of stuff. Uh, and I think the Bismarck uh, Energy Center of Excellence, they use that fly ash from uh, Coal Creek for the, for the building. And you can see, I mean, that's a 
gorgeous building yeah. on the use of the highway construction, all that kind of thing. So anything that we can do with, again, creating another revenue center would be important, which is why we're trying to tap uh, into that program. In a broader sense, though, Jason, back to that earlier question you asked me about the approach, whether the administration we have continues or you get um, a new administration and a plan laid out uh, by Vice President, former Vice President uh, Biden. Um, if we're going to develop those things in this uh, country, rare earth minerals or anything else, we've got to have the kind of legal tax and regulatory environment that empowers us to do that. If every time somebody wants to innovate or do something, they're stopped by the EPA or a bunch of lawsuits, we can't develop that stuff here. And then we are dependent on other countries like China for those rare earth minerals, which we certainly don't want. So, Senator, uh, now that we're on rare earth elements, I got a, a follow-up question with that. And you know, as you mentioned, you know, today a lot of the rare earth elements and globally are, are controlled by the Chinese. Right. And for the U.S. companies to make investments in infrastructure to support the rare earth element production, there will need to be some kind of federal action to either guarantee a price floor or require that you know, quote unquote, U.S. produce rare earth elements that are in products. Uh, produce, purchased by either Department of Defense or other federal customers. Is, has Congress explored any options like that? Yeah, we. I mean, we have legislation in our energy committee to do that. We haven't been able to move it yet um, because we have opposition from the people that don't want any of those things developed here. You know, it's the, only, the, the not in my backyard mindset. And the reality is, we have the best technology in the world here in the United States. If any place can develop it with the right kind of environmental stewardship, it's us. When we end up not doing it here, then we're dependent on some other country like China. And not only then does that create a dependency we don't want and an economic disadvantage and so forth, but also their environmental standards are nowhere near ours. So uh, yeah, exactly right. We have legislation that would help us do that. Senator Murkowski has been, you know, our energy chair has been very forward leading on the rare earth minerals issue. And I'm hopeful that we can, we can pass it. So, and I, I did receive another follow-up question that's, that's a different topic, you know, just more of the general politics, right? We've, we've seen a, you know, we go back to January, um, the economy was good. A lot of things were moving along. We had impeachment hearings in the Senate. That was kind of the news of the day, but everybody generally felt pretty good about the state of you know, jobs and economy and all that. Then we've had uh, COVID-19, drastic change in the economy, um, the focus of the, go the federal government, state governments, all of that, uh, followed up by George Floyd, um, you know, and the fallout of that and all of kind of the civil unrest. Given that, where do you think, you know, here we are a couple months out from election day, what's your read of the tea leaves of where this all goes um, in the elections? I think that people are increasingly now going to push back in terms of making sure that we're a safe country, that we're a country that respects law and order. Our First Amendment rights come from enforcement of the law. You know, we're a country of laws, our constitution, and we have to make sure that we are enforcing those laws and enforcing that constitution because that protects every single one of us. The protester only has the right and the ability to protest if you enforce the law. That's part of your first uh, amendment rights. And so I, this whole defund the police, um, tearing things down, uh, you know, that all of that puts all of us at risk. Lawful, peaceful protest is a right that people have, and it should be respected. But at the same time, you can only have that right if you respect law and order, and we enforce law and order in this country. I think that is incredibly important. I think that's going to be a very important issue in the election. Yes, we understand that there are reforms needed in various ways, but at the same time, 
We've got to support law enforcement. We've got to support our police officers and our other first responders who are out there putting their life on the line to protect us, just as we support our military because they put their life on the line to protect us throughout the world. We cannot lose that fundamental understanding that that is what keeps our country together. And then and only then can we be safe in our homes and our communities and work the way we want and worship the way that we want and our homes and our families are protected. That is a fundamentally important thing that, that I think the American people know and will increasingly, I think, start to push back and say, yes, we can have protest. Yes, we know we can always do things better and that we need reforms in certain areas, but we have to value, protect, and respect those fundamentals and the people that make sure that we have them, that enforce the law in a way that keeps us the safest and strongest country in the world. And I think that that is really important as we go into this election. So uh, another kind of uh, election question. So where, where do you think, you know, a lot of the national polling um, has, has the president struggling at the moment? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not one that, look, I mean, if you looked at the polling last time, it wasn't right. Um, you know, as they say, the times, they are a changing. And uh, I don't know that, you know, it's like anything else. Um, there's a lot of polls, but um, I, I always go back to, you know, I think people look, look to what's important for them. And to me, it always kind of comes back to those basics. Um, one of which I just touched on, making sure that we have respect for law and order, making sure that we support our first responders and our military and all those people that keep us safe, uh, a pro-business environment that enables us to do the kind of things that our energy industry, all of you and others have done, you know, uh, in this state. Obviously, the COVID thing is the COVID fight's front and center. We, we got that, and we need to continue to support our doctors and nurses and healthcare providers and not just the healthcare, but the long-term care, because it's really the, the seniors that are most at risk here. That's got to be, you know, a, a big part of, of what we focus on and, and develop solutions for. Um, we have to we have to recognize we got a debt and deficit, and we have to be serious about addressing it. You know, all those I call those the fundamentals that make our country work and that make life better for our people day in and day out. And I think at the end of the day, that's really the proposition that voters decide on. They're going to go to the polls, they're going to have a clear choice, and they'll make their decision. And so where there's going to be a lot of back and forth between now and election day and up and down and all around, and you know how that goes. But I think at the end of the day, people will make a decision on those uh, fundamentals and they'll have a clear choice. Senator, uh, we got about, oh, go ahead, Luke. Okay, uh, so I've got, a, I've got another kind of follow up on that. So, and it's kind of a two part, but so if Joe Biden is elected president, uh, one, what is, what is the outlook for North Dakota's energy industry? I mean, we saw his plan, but you know, how do you think that changes? And if, if we're still a divided uh, Congress, you know, that, that, that could help offset some of that. Um, and then two, uh, you know, we, we just beat back the clean power plan. We put ACE in its place, but there's still some steps to go through that. Do you think ACE you know, is, is gonna be positioned well enough to carry us through any major change? You know, I, I, I sure hope so, but obviously I would be concerned because I think uh, under a Biden administration, obviously we'd go back to, uh, you, you know, approach that is very much more controlled by the uh, federal government and the EPA and very less entrepreneurial in terms of, you know, allowing states to be working with industry and develop all of the different types of energy resources with the latest, greatest technologies, whether it's fossil fuels and traditional sources of energy or renewables with a more market-based approach. And, and I think, you know, again, a clear distinction between going back to, like I say, more of what you saw under the Obama administration versus what you now see, uh, you know, in, in terms of the lesser, lesser tax, lesser regulation uh, that you have with the Trump administration. Now, I think that'd be a concern for, and obviously, I think that'd be a real concern for North Dakota. Absolutely, yes. We got a, about eight more minutes, Senator. I'll, I'll ask you a question that's kind of more broad in nature, maybe take you back to your days as governor, but. 
seeing what we're going through with this COVID stuff, kind of the social unrest, uh, being a, having been a governor now in, in the Senate, with a crisis like this, what is, I mean, does that change how you look at the strengths and weaknesses of a federalist country like ours? Of just, yes. you know, the states, how vastly different they approach these things, just general thoughts on that. Well, you know, having been a governor, again, I may have uh, some bias there, but I, you know, the United States was set up uh, at, with the states being laboratories for democracy. And the whole idea was that uh, because we have a state-based system, then states can do things that make sense for their people and, and their part of the country. And I think we've seen that dramatically with North Dakota in the way we've become, I mean, we've always been an ag powerhouse, but we've become an absolute energy powerhouse for this country. And I think North Dakota is known not only nationally, but internationally, uh, because, you know, 1.5 million barrels of oil a day, uh, you know, we're going head to head with OPEC. Our coal-fired electric industry is doing innovations that nobody else does. At the same time, we do a, a lot in the renewable energy as well. We've interfaced with uh, our ag base as well. And, and we've, you know, just done a lot of innovative, creative things that you could not probably have done if you didn't have a state-based system where you have the states as laboratories of democracy. So. I'm a big fan of that, and I'm a big fan of giving governors discretion. So I understand, you know, with, with COVID, for example, we have to have a federal approach because, you know, obviously the disease goes across state boundaries. So I get that. But at the same time, I think you need the flexibility to allow states to do what makes sense for uh, each individual state. Governor Burgum's, I think, done a, uh, an excellent job of leading the state in terms of fighting the COVID virus. And the things that we do out here on the ground are very different than what they need to do in New York or maybe in California or down in Louisiana or somewhere else. And so I think that demonstrates the importance of the flexibility that a state-based system gives us. And I think that's one of the reasons the United States is the strongest country in the history of the world is because we have the strength of being a, a large country, uh, but we're not so, so federalized that we don't have that flexibility to do innovative and creative things across the country. And I think we have to remember that if we get too big, too powerful, all-consuming federal government, it's going to take away that discretion at the state level to the detriment of our country. And I think that's a real risk. And so this push towards socialism, where the federal government's going to control everything that everyone does, I think is a very, is the wrong way to go. And that we have to look back to those fundamentals I talked about earlier, one of which is state flexibility as part of the real strength of our country and something that's very important in terms of the freedoms and the opportunities that our people have. Thank you. Yeah, well, and on the energy thing, you were probably infuriated by this back in the day too when you'd have the Obama administration coming in and trumpeting, hey, we've had the greatest year over year increase in oil in the country's history. Well, all the federal policies were anti-oil, but it was literally North Dakota's production that was allowing President Obama to make that claim that, hey, we've increased, we have increased oil production when it was policies that uh, came into play when you were governor and, and after uh, that allowed him to say that. But, uh, right, and it was, really, it was really the innovation of our industry that did it. And it's only when you create an environment where they can innovate that they're able to do it. And, and uh, no, you're exactly right. So, uh, that brings us close to three o'clock, Senator. Thank you for being with us. Um, any closing thoughts? Yeah, just just that you know we are in in a, a challenging time right now, not just the COVID, but with just changes in the energy industry. And and uh, you all have been incredibly important in terms of energy leaders uh, for this country. And that uh, you know, on behalf of me, and I really do have a fantastic staff. You've got Eric on the. Uh, for, uh, teleconference here with us, but I, I do have a great group. We want to stay plugged in with you and work with you to make sure that we're doing everything that we can uh, to help uh, you do all the great things that you have done and, and continue to do in the energy world. Thank you, so, and, and thanks to your staff as well. Go ahead, Jonathan. 
Senator, I, I, have, I have one last question to kind of send you off with. So last week we got the bad news that the Pac-10 was going to cancel the preseason, the non-conference games. How lucky is the University of Oregon that they don't have to face Trey Lance and the Bison? I tell you, uh, that would have. I, I hope we still get to play the game at some point, right? Uh, and particularly with Trey Lance, uh, his he's incredible. But, but having so many of our players back this year, it would have been a great time to play them because I think we have a really, really strong team. They had a, they have a new quarterback coming in, and I would have loved to get him their first game, you know, before he kind of gets a chance to, you know, get some more experience. So I really feel, I agree. I, I think they're fortunate. I think the Bison were, were ready to go down there and, uh, you know, as they say, uh, shock the world. Um, but I don't know if it's that shocking anymore. Our team is that good. I mean, right. um, people know. Um, they, they know that when, when the Bison come to town, um, it, it's the real thing. So hopefully hopefully we'll, we'll get that game in the future, right? I think it'd be, a, it, yeah. I think it'd be fantastic. Thanks for the question, though. Go Bison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Senator. Thanks to your staff. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks for working with you with us. We'll be in touch on on these and more issues in the future. But thank you to all of our members for joining us, taking some time to visit with your senator. And thanks for your representation. Appreciate it, guys. Take care. Thanks. Bye.